Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Crypto Lab with me, your old pal Fuzz, and my old pal Sean Ed. Hello. We're uh, starting up a new podcast about role playing games, uh, uh, one particular brand in particular, the White Wolf Phonics Path. Um, and we're going to discuss. Everything about it, what we love, what we hate, all that good stuff. So stick with us. Um, so tell me when you first discovered White Wolf. Um, I was 16, and this was 1994, 93, 94. And uh, I had just, we just done our big second edition um, D&D runs, and we would gotten that out of our system when we were 13, 14, moved on to uh, a couple years of trying everything else that was out there. So we had, you know, we did Shadowrun. Um, I found out that, you know, about TMNT and other strangeness. Um, we did, uh, of course, Palladium, and we and Rifts was just getting big, so we started it. Uh, and was, that's what I was running. And then we were in Rifts because of the Megaverse was just endless possibilities, so we ran it nonstop. And then I pick up a copy of Werewolf the Apocalypse first and kind of thumb through it, and I was like, this is really cool. It's kind of a different take on werewolves. They're kind of tribal, and they've got this shamanism aspect of them and then I saw that uh, the same people made Mage the Ascension so I picked it up and then within a, uh, a few months I found out that there was Vampire, it had already been out it was on second edition, there's all these other things that I didn't even, didn't even knew exist mm -hmm. that were all could f feasibly be interconnected but the first game I ran was a werewolf game, and I only ran a couple sessions of it just to kind of get my feel for the system. Uh, Mage, we tried, and we were like, this is just not <laughs> not happening. This is beyond our yeah. high school prepubescent minds. Yeah. Um, and then... Mage was no joke. No, it wasn't. <laughs> and Because werewolf was pretty cut and dry. Yeah. You can turn into big beasts. You can kill stuff. Uh, and then you could do this cool magic shit. And then that, that was pretty much it. And then you start learning the cosmology and learning about it. And, of course, everyone was in the pack. We were all cubs. You know, was, I just kind of went through the way the book handed it to mm -hmm. you. And then I introduced vampires. And, of course, at that time, uh, Anne Rice was huge. Mm -hmm. Interviews of Vampire had come out. Um, and everyone was big into vampires then. It wasn't like Twilight, stupid. Yeah. But it was, you know, people were starting to be like, oh, vampires could be cool. And so then some people wanted to play vampires. Some people were like, nah, don't want that. I still want to kill my killing machines. Mm. And I started running this game. And then we found out about, um, and at that time, I think I had gotten up to maybe like eight people in my, ga in my game. And then after that, after a couple of years, um, Changeling had come out. And we started running it, uh, and then throwing that in there. And that's where TK mm -hmm. uh, came into the into the fold, and you know that infamous asshole. Yeah. And then right around that time, when that kind of younger group of guys I started hanging out with, Justin, uh, Jonesy, Cornish, all those guys. Uh, that's when I started. That's when I met you. Mm -hmm. And then then you were like, I noticed you had books, and I was like, oh hey. And then I was like, oh here's. KOE, this is really cool, and mm -hmm. you and I are like pawning over that at uh, at uh, Perkins late yeah. night, smoking, playing magic, looking at this. Yeah, we we're like, whoa. And then I'm like, okay, um, I want you to come into my game. Yeah, make this character whatever you want, and you're like, ah, I will do that. <laughs> yeah. And there's the most infamous character in all of our White Wolf games for the last twenty years came yeah. about. But that was yeah, and then you know the, the you know the, you know the rest of the history from there. Um, what about you? When did you start getting into uh, World of Darkness? Um, I had been weaned on D&D &D 
for several years um, and I had run Heroes Unlimited, Villains Unlimited, uh, TMNT, uh, Road Hogs, um, what, after the bomb, all mm -hmm. that stuff. And, um, you know, uh, Palladium versus second. Well, uh, my parents bought me the red box of D and D that sort of first generation D and D. And then yeah. I got my hands on a bunch of secondhand second edition stuff. And most of it flew right over my head. Uh, I didn't understand Thacko. Um, I must have read it a hundred times. And I, I, it's just the way that my brain worked, especially back then, was that if someone wasn't showing it to me or I wasn't seeing it being done, it was really hard for me to put what was on the page into, act, right. you know, yeah. make it actually happen. And um, then one day um, we saw a poster at metropolis the comic book shop yep. and it said uh there was this kind of amber colored uh werewolf uh, sort of haunched over in this sort of almost kind of desolate and um um you know like toxic looking environment and there was a big moon in the background and it just said werewolf uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I may have said the apocalypse I don't remember but then beneath it it had a date and I was like what the hell is that because I was a werewolf kid growing up you yeah. know and so like I love that and so then uh, we were looking around in the racks and we looked at back in the role playing game section and there it was it was uh, Vampire the Embraced Yeah. Uh, way before it was the masquerade, masquerade and all yeah. that stuff and um we uh picked up a copy took it home i read it like a crazy person and didn't really get it mm. um because in my mind everything required a d20 yeah. and you know and all that stuff and so when it was just like yeah pool of d10s i hadn't played shadowrun at the time so pools of dice didn't really make much sense to me. Yeah. And so um, I kind of played in a, in a few games with some other guys in high school. Just kind of feeling it out. Um, and, of course, they were terrible because, you know, it was all guys who had never gamed before, you know, who were trying to run games for the first time. Sure. And, um, but, you know, the thing was is that White Wolf, unlike everything else was somehow more serious yeah. of a game everything else inevitably devolved into stupidity you know D&D &D always had that tendency of crazy stuff going on and players just inevitably throwing their hands up and going I'm going to do blah whatever it is that's just dumb Right. but whereas White Wolf that for some reason that never happened there was a gravitas to it that the other games didn't have and so uh, I played in it in a few times and then eventually I started running games in it um, trying to trying to iron it out um, but to be entirely honest a lot of it was still kind of over my head and uh, then Werewolf came out and I got my copy of that which I still have on yeah. the shelf up there which is in ridiculously mint condition. <laughs> yeah. And, compared um, to mine that has no cover. Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, I got Werewolf and I read it. And I was immediately completely enthralled by it. Um, and we started running games. I started playing in other guys' games. And then I got a feel for the system. And I kind of begun to uh, understand what it was what the the mechanics were and how you could use the mechanics to your own benefit which was yeah. like a revelation because back when we were playing heroes unlimited everything was there for you every yeah. level you mm -hmm. know if you shoot fireballs every level you gain or you know plus one d6 or yeah. whatever it was and you knew exactly the book told you everything and that was the thing that started my kind of love-hate relationship with the way they do the White Wolf books. Because in the beginning, 
they would give you fiction to kind of set you in the environment right. and then they would give you stats that allowed you to operate in that environment and then of course later on they started with the whole untrustworthy narrator shit where you were like yeah, okay I just read this whole thing and then the next character that pops up is like yeah that guy's full of shit none of that really happened and you're like what yeah come on yeah you know but uh, yeah and then eventually um, I, I ignored mage completely it, it was I, I remember i was at i think it was at barnes and noble and uh, i was looking the book over and i thought to myself like yeah this would be kind of cool i mean like i don't get how wizards are horror yeah. but whatever i was like you know cool it, it's it's new material right and then i started looking through it and i did what everyone does i went straight to you know the the different traditions and i looked at the powers and as soon as i looked at the powers i was like what yeah and i was like okay this is this is not gonna happen it's totally different than yeah. any other it's hard to believe that the same guy came up with that system yeah. that also came up i mean and now that i'm older and i understand it, it i get it it's creative it's devastatingly creative but that whole game line was you know it was like you know getting out of jail having been in jail for 10 years mm -hmm. and you're getting ready to to hop on the bus and they walk up to you and they say oh hold on and they clamp a great big you know metal iron ball to your leg and they mm -hmm. say now go ahead have fun yep. you know that paradox thing was just yeah mind-boggling to me i was like why would you why would you do this yeah and i eventually picked a game up um but I, or no, 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 I borrowed it from a friend and I read it and I tried to run it and I ended up running the game without Paradox. Yeah. And of course the game went completely berserk sure. because you could do You have anything. no limits, yeah. yeah. And I didn't understand why the game sucked. And then finally I was like, well, it's obviously got to be because of this Paradox thing. Um, I ignored Changeling. Um because I a friend of mine had the book and he loaned it to me and I read it and I was like so they're fairy monsters but normal people can't see them as fairy monsters yeah unless they give them magic fairy juice that lets them see them as monsters yeah and like you can be watching Fay having these epic battles but to you, they just look like two hobos swinging, you know, buckets at each other. Right. But yeah. in their world, yeah. they're they're these mighty knights, you know, yeah. and and all this stuff. They're they're larpers before larping was cool. Yeah, and I was just like, what? Yeah, I was like, I don't get it. And you know, and again, to me, it wasn't horror. And so I was like, all right, whatever. And then finally, I got my hands on a wraith book, <laughs> and I thought. Like this is this is gonna be cool. This is gonna yeah. be horror, and it was the most depressing game oh, yeah. ever. And I remember I tried to run Wraith probably three or four times, and every time my entire group, which was between six and about twelve people at the time, yeah, everyone came up to me and was like, "I don't want to play this game. Like this is depressing. This sucks. I don't want to do this." And all I was doing was just going along with what the book had set up, right? But they were just like, yeah, this this blows, dude. Let's, I, I want to play werewolf. Okay, you know, we'll play werewolves then. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, all the Sabbat stuff started coming out. And, right. You know, and then you had that big, you know, thing where it was, you know, you're either Disney and you were Camarilla or you were Sabbat and you were hardcore cool. Yeah. And then all the players divided up and almost exclusively the girls went to Camarilla and the guys all sure. went to Sabbat. And... Then we started in with, you know, saying, well, you know what, we got all this, you can play a werewolf. And then, okay, cool. And then the werewolf shows up and everybody's like, okay, cool. And then the first time the werewolf gets lippy, and the vampires are like, I'm super badass. I'm going to kick, I'm going to knock you the fuck out. And the werewolf's <laughs> like, really? Squash. And then like, you know, player deaths all over oh, the place. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> and... You know, and then, you know, like all the other stuff sort of coming out, your Project Twilights, and, you know, they released, 
this uh, World of Darkness book really early on that I picked up, and it was basically a setting book. Uh, it didn't really have a whole lot. And then I picked up that, uh, I think it was called The Big Book of Combat, or it might yeah. have just been called White Wolf Combat. I yeah. can't remember. But like that was talking about making cards, and so we had guys over at the garage, and everybody's cutting out cards and writing up all yeah. this stuff, and you know we were just going bananas with it. Um, and it was so cool because you know like D and D had put out, you know like the book of psionics or the book of you know treants or whatever, right? And you know you had all this pointless information usually about stuff that you didn't really want to use to begin with. Absolutely. And it was like all right, but then White Wolf started releasing all these little books that were just crazy. Oh yeah. And next thing you know, you're like, well, ghouls are cool, you know, or what the hell is a risen? I want to know what's up with right. that, you know. Yeah. And of course, the risen came right after the crow. Sure. And so everybody was like, oh, "I'm uh, playing yeah, a risen." Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And so, which were just devastating yeah, to the game. Yeah. And everybody's like Brandon Lee for for six uh -huh. months before you finally realize that risen are tough. Oh. Like yeah. risen are hard to run games for. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, then you get like you know you got into the bygone beast series. Yeah. So then you had like the weird off the wall characters like Jim playing a griffin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just these weird things. Yeah, you could do you do crazy stuff and because we both ran non canon games. Oh, totally. And so it was, you know, we used the World of Darkness as a very loose framework mm. for what we wanted to do. And I think I know that there's a lot of hardcore canon guys out there, but I think pretty much everybody ditched canon fairly quickly or at least at some point during their game you don't really have much of a choice i think but i know that there are some gung-ho canon guys out there sure. who never strayed but the idea of playing a vampire in a world where you're playing and you're under the thumb of a sire who is under the thumb of a sire who's under the thumb of a sire and then who's under the thumb of a prince it just seemed boring, you know, yeah. especially when we were young. It was like, you know, you want to run wild. You want to, oh, yeah. you know, you want to do all the crazy well, shit. Well, you had so many, like, what we consider now cult classic or just mainstream epic action movies. Yeah. That, and, it, and it, I mean, obviously at the time it was very, the, the game, the role playing um, hobby was very male dominated. So, of course, we're, ba a lot of people are basing it, like you said, off of Crow. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Stargate came out, so everyone wants to play mummies. Yeah. You know, cool stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, the thing about it is, is that we're, we're all playing these really cool characters, but um, I found that, like, the games, when I talked to people that played, like, a, a canon game, especially, like, Vampire, was always a big one. Because that way they can get the girls to play. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, at the time, especially, you know, you're like, hey, I can get a girl to play in a role-playing game. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, but when they play, it was, it wasn't like, obviously Twilight wasn't around at the time and all those books, but it was very much like, you need to get a rose from this elder who politically has upset your sire. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do this one thing. And it was a lot of political play and the girls always played, you know, sex bombs. Yeah. Always. They always use their looks for whatever they could get away yeah. with. And it became such a trope, um, of, of the, of the white wolf field, yeah. you know, that eventually the world of darkness, goth girl. Yeah. 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 And that eventually when, you know, now people, when they talk about world of darkness, they almost, re they almost relate it back to, well, I wore black, all black, mm -hmm. or I had these girls that were all in black makeup. And yeah. that, that's what they think of. And it's unfortunate because in this kind of w world now that we're in, where, um, role playing has become a little bit, a, a, a lot more mainstream compared to the way you, yeah. you know, you and I were 20 years ago. They, <laughs> they, think badly on world of darkness yeah which i think is unfortunate because of the fact that a lot of people played these strictly canon games yeah that were basing it so much off of these angsty you know movies and they could have done so much more with it oh, they sure. just followed the golden rule that was printed in every white wolf yeah. book which is do whatever do the whatever you want, you want. Yeah. yeah yeah that was always my favorite rule yeah but yeah like i i think that. You know, for for me, when I started running Dark Ages, 
that and I started running with your guys as well as my own guys. Yeah. That was when my kind of career as a game master really started as a storyteller because you guys had been running a pretty dense game uh, on your side of the fence in your modern day. And so when I started running Dark Ages, I knew that, you know, I needed to populate this thing with everything I could think of and try and find some way to make it make sense, make it cool and make it threatening. <clears throat> and, you know, that was why, I mean, shit, I had the Baba Yaga in like the first game or the second yeah. game. You know, I had, yeah, you know, like I was using major mythological figures across the board. Yeah. And I was introducing all these secret societies and Illuminati style things and demons and all this shit before we had any rules on how those oh, kinds of things no, operated. Yeah. And, you know, we just went bananas with it. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think my favorite part of White Wolf after I kind of genuinely got my head around it was how the system worked. Yeah. Um, because it was so unbelievably simple. You know, every, well, I, I think each maybe, dot is each dot is one dice. Yeah, yeah. You know? So maybe we should discuss that because I mean, for, there's a lot of people that are right now. You know, I kind of talked before we started that D and D is the it's always been the 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 golden child of role playing. Yeah. And but I think for people that maybe are going to hear this that don't know how White Wolf works, or maybe just heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know the, the the cool thing about White Wolf is that it's a it, it's very simplistic. You use ten siders um, solely, um, and it's based around the idea. All of the crazy noises going on is the dog being kept in her kennel right now, and she's going berserk. Yes. So ignore that. Anyway, continue. And uh, and you assign your character dots. Um, there's, there's attributes like there is in um, D and D, you know, that represent um, the very basics of your character: strength, dexterity, stamina, intelligence, appearance, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then you have what they call abilities, which are like skills, um, you know, driving, shooting a gun, melee, um, perception, the almighty finance. Yeah, finance, <laughs> finance. Yes. Um, and then you, um, and then you put. When you put assign those dots and in the and the what they call the storyteller, which is their version of the dungeon master, um, tells you to make your roll. They'll say, um, for instance, if you're gonna s slash your sword at the gargoyle, it's gonna be a dexterity and melee. So you count that number of dots, you roll that number of ten siders. Um, you have a target number, which is a difficulty for every time you hit that, you get a success, and then if you get a one, you get a botch, just like in. D and D, the, there's always a, a, a margin of error, um, but ultimately, what they kept kind of pushing in the world of darkness, as opposed to the these Heroes Unlimited, Palladium, D and D, all these very dice heavy games, which even at that time, you and I were still, and I still do. That's like one of the things that mm -hmm. you know we've talked about is I still have. This thing about rolling dice, yeah. you know, but they push. yeah you you play ultimately like pass or fail. I I do very stuff, much. Yeah. It's just totally opposite. We can get into that, but but uh, it's there is the idea that they try to push you away from that. They, mm -hmm. they even have rules saying if you have so many, um, ultimately would be so big a dice pool, you can just opt out of it. Yeah. most of the time on, on stuff that's non conflicting or yeah. contested, um, but uh. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, I just, yeah, I, was, I was noticed that we were talking about, you know, that. And I think we, some of the people might not know why that is because this is, World of Darkness is storytelling games. Yeah, they ultimately are role playing games, but they really push the idea of telling a round circle of stories that we're all taking a part of, rather than just saying, "What's your action? Roll the dice. Let's yeah. move on." Yeah, and you know. I realize that the game is much more sophisticated than it is now, especially D and D, where you know you hear people talking about the storyline yeah. of D and D of the games that they're playing, and to me, I'm like, what? It's like, you know, I mean, even when we played 
Ravenloft, mm -hmm. and that's a, a massively story-driven D and D game. The only thing I can remember is that we killed a bunch of gypsies, and we fought a werewolf, and um, my character ran up, and I tried to stab Strahd in the head, and I <laughs> failed miserably, and he killed me. Like that's that's all I remember about yeah. playing Ravenloft. Yeah, you know. Dark Sun was even worse. I that that's my favorite setting oh, in D and D. Absolutely, it's just it's brutal. It's so good. I mean, I love Ravenloft. It's easily my second favorite. Um, you know, and if given an opportunity, I would never touch Forgotten Realms or, you know, Planescape has always seemed interesting, but I only got a chance to play it once when I was young. Yeah. Um, but like the thing, the thing that was always so great was that you could literally craft your own stories. There were no modules. You know, even when they released module like stuff with White Wolf, like the Succubus Club and things mm -hmm. like that, uh, what was it uh, Blood Red Moon? I think is what it was called. Yeah. Um, or Blood Dim Tide, I think is what it was. Yeah. Um, uh, where they introduced abominations, and I was like, Oh my god! Yeah. And you know, I was just, I was so hyped. But yeah. But like they, even when they introduced module modular style playing. They still encouraged you to do your own thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was a long time before you found out who the canon prince of Chicago or New York or London. You know, it was it was a long time before you really got to know who those people were in what was supposed to be the canon version of the game, because you know it. In a town like this, especially back then, finding role-playing game books, you know, the guys were only buying the ones that they knew, were, or were only stocking the ones they knew were going to sell. Sure. And so, you know, that was all, you know, uh, uh, Shadowrun, Earth Dawn, yeah. you know, Palladium stuff with uh, Rifts and yeah. Nightbane and all that kind of stuff. They knew that that shit would sell, but... You know the the who's who of a Camarilla book for twelve ninety nine. Nobody was stocking that because it was literally just a book full of really bad pictures and really <laughs> really simple stats, yeah. and there was nothing else to it. No, yeah, yeah. And you know, uh, like the but th that was what made it so cool was because you were forced to build this whole world that wasn't sword and sorcery. And it wasn't, it wasn't camp. It was, it was, it was hardcore, and you were responsible for making it brutal, absolutely, or you were responsible for it failing miserably. There was no way to fix it, and that was always the thing. Was D and D, you could always kind of fix it. There was always a way. There was a monster, or there was a spell, or there was a something. Oh yeah, that could fix any amount of fuckery that people brought to the table. You know, we joke about this all the time, is that yeah. games would be great if it wasn't for, for the fucking players. players. Yeah. You know, but, you know, but the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, hell, we've been game mastering now for probably 25 years mm -hmm. each now. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I, I still always come back to White Wolf. You yeah. know, we played Star Wars for a while. We played, you know, um, I mean, some Masterminds. We played... Uh, um, all kinds of different stuff. I mean, literally just tons and tons of different things. And yet, at the end of the day, it's like, well, I want to run a cool game. Look through the White Wolf Absolutely. stuff. Yeah, I, you know? I was running my 10-year um, D&D 3.5 game, and there was a couple times we'd take breaks and try to run something else, and always... The most successful was ever, and everyone asked if we we're going to take a break to do something else was White Wolf, mm -hmm. because it's easy to pick up yeah. no matter your experience level. Yeah, I tell people all the time, yeah. you give me two, three games, and I'll have you hooked. Yeah, even if you've never played once in your life, yeah. you've never wanted to. I promise you, you give me three games, you're in for life. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah, but like when we, because I mean, we we had a break where. Like, you know, the whole kind of group kind of splintered off and sure. did their own stuff. And earlier on this year, I said, you know, I feel like having a little more Sean Ed in my life. <laughs> and so you were talking about how you were going to run this kind of uh, space pirate kind of thing. And then um, you started talking about 
um, you know, developing stuff for your for your book. Yeah. Um, which Sean Ed is an aspiring author. Um, and, and Fuzz is an author. Yes. Not that not I'm, aspiring. Yeah. He's already done <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. And he's on the third one. Yeah. But the thing is... Autumnville is, is great, by the way. Buy it. it it's is. on Amazon and Kindle. <laughs> and you can also order it um, from directly from Phil. And he'll only charge you double the price. It's a really yeah. good deal. Yeah. It's super good. He'll sign the copy, though. Yeah. But he'll sign it to somebody else. Like yeah. my name. Yeah. So, but like the thing was, is that like I had these Scion books that I hadn't touched in years. Yeah. I mean, and you could tell by the look of them because they were essentially in mint condition <laughs> like so many of your books yeah. yeah well it's weird because like when it comes to novels i will beat novels to death yeah but when it comes to my game books for some reason i they, they are always in good condition and that's the total opposite all my novels are like pristine i'll read them once put yeah. them away and store them and all my role playing books are like i've been yeah, loading them out the yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but yeah so then um you know i uh i mentioned scion as a as an idea because we were going to run aberrant aberrant yeah yeah, yeah we, were we actually aberrant. made up the characters for aberrant yeah yeah, yeah. we played one of yeah them. because um you know uh, aberrant is another white wolf product it's incredible um yes it is it's one of two of that little trinity of books that were amazing the unfortunately aeon trinity the the space book was always kind of lame <laughs> so, i mean it, it was just panned by the forums it yeah. was paying by the players well, i mean the the for for me like i was okay with their idea of saying we're going to do a book that's essentially about multiculturalism and that is about a planet of people who are now kind of forced to at least attempt to work together with an undercurrent of you know uh political uh, intrigue and um secret societies and all this kind of stuff and I was fine with it, but the problem for me with that was I got the book, the original ring binder book, mm -hmm. you know, with the cardboard uh, cover and mm -hmm. the, all that stuff. Yeah. And when um, uh, I think my original copy was actually called Aeon, it was before they got sued. And then I got uh, the Trinity book later. But um, I remember reading it and thinking, you know, this is actually kind of interesting. This is kind of neat, but I can't pronounce any of these names. <laughs> like, like, yeah. You know, th there were uh, the teleporters were called the what is it? U Upa wa Macho, and <laughs> like, you know, like there was like the yeah. they're called like Nor Norse Norcia or Nor Norsica uh -huh. or something. And I was just like, you know, at least White Wolf proper World of Darkness. When I first saw the word uh, Zimshi or Zimitsi, yeah. however people like to pronounce it, there were things beneath it that allowed you to say it phonetically. Yeah, yeah phonetically. So that you yeah. were like, oh, okay, that's how you yeah. say this. Yeah. Okay, cool. But Trinity never did that. No. And so, you know, and it hyped up so much cool stuff, but then it just failed to deliver. All of the products that came along with it were done in those little tiny, you know, maybe 15 page booklets. Yeah. And you know very little of the information was actually valuable it was mostly just you know uh plot line yeah, for, a, for a lot of a lot of flavor text yeah well you know it reminded me of um did you ever read that comic uh elephant men that came yeah. out oh, it kind of reminded me of elephant men it was like the first run of it was interesting but like the fans i always wanted to know see the war yeah. i wanted to because they always flash back to it yeah and you'd see crazy anthropomorphic animals yeah. doing badass shit and you're like i want this and then suddenly they came started coming out with the 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 ones about the war and all mm -hmm. that just that exploded the series and they yeah. got all these great awards and stuff for that that was kind of the way i saw trinity was that it was like this is really cool but wait wait superheroes yeah. there was there, there was superheroes and yeah. you're not gonna give us all the cool stuff about yeah. them and then they're like here's Abbott and I remember you and I like drooling yeah. over the book well because Jim just showed up one day and was like hey here's this book yeah as he did all the time yeah. he would do that all the time he would just pop up and go here's a new book read it <laughs> yeah and I'd be like okay and I remember looking at the cover artwork and thinking this looks 
this looks ridiculous. Yeah. You know, this is such horrible artwork. But I was like, oh, well. And I started reading it and I thought, God damn, this reminds me of the Fomori. Mm. Like the system that they have in here is how the Fomori are built. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And then I started reading like Mega Strength and I remember going, what? Yeah, it was insane. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. 25 successes for a strength <laughs> roll? I was like, what? Yeah. And then I started seeing like soak values and, and you know, and all this stuff. And, and I was just like, okay, hold on. We have to play this. <laughs> And, you know, and then right away, that was how, I mean, we had probably a 10 year run yeah, with oh, Aberrant, yeah. you know, of just, you know, people designing their flagship character, mm -hmm. you know, and that was always my thing. And I think we kind of share the same vibe on this is that I was always a DC guy, not a Marvel guy. Sure. Because yeah. in character design, yeah. because Marvel is notorious for you have a power. Yeah. And DC was always notorious for this guy should be God, you know, like this guy has 15 powers, you know, and a whole suite of sub powers yes. that make him unbelievably crazy. And I always liked that more than the Marvel idea of, you know, I turn into steel or I have claws, you know, or whatever it was. I think you and I have always, though, even in world, of, even in our world of darkness, your Dark Ages campaign, we always kind of amped it up to 11. Oh, yeah. We were always big, go big or go home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of the definition of the power gamer munchkin types, you know. But that's because we wanted it to be cinematic. Yeah. That was always the big thing was, you know, I wanted to run games with, you know, wars of, you know, 30,000 men charging over a hill right. and two vampires standing there going you know all right we're gonna have to kick somebody's ass yeah you know like that was what <laughs> yeah. i wanted and no, so no. like that was what you know that was the kind of stuff that i wanted to to do because you know i always thought that the coolest thing about role playing was that you could make an epic game you could make something that was on the scale that you wanted it to be and there was no one who could tell you no yeah and you know and i was just thought that was so great of uh of uh, a style of storytelling nowadays it's you know it's kind of passe and silly you know to to have these kinds of huge you know overarching campaigns and all this kind of stuff because now it's cool to have the very deep personal storyline where you know the player is crying and you know and is you know it is like oh my god I, you know i'm I'm going to roll finance, you know, and, you know, and, and w what have you, you know, but like, yeah. you know, back when we were doing, you know, the game hardcore, it was like, you know, you had crazy robots from fucking, uh, ghost in the shell yeah. in your game. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, you I, put, had, I put the robot tank. Yeah. You know, you had. You know, fleets of zombies. You had, oh, yeah. uh, I can't even remember what the the guy named Mask was. But I just oh, remember yeah. he was like a crazy yeah, badass. Was also, yeah. You know, there was all kinds of cool stuff in your game, you know. And, and I always tried to do the same thing. And just have big, bad, you know, big, bad guys. But, and, and that kind of brings me back because, you know, like Aberrant was an extension of that. You could do yes. insane stuff with Aberrant. And Adventure came out, and, and Adventure was so, like, a delicate version of Aberrant. I never played Adventure. Oh, man. We'll, we'll have to set you, it up. Yeah, I mean, because... you, tell, you tell me some pretty good um, stories from when you and, and, and Sean Barry yeah. were playing it. And yeah, it sounds Sean, really fun. Yeah, Sean Barry, that's that's his genre, is that 1920s Which I know, love. style yeah, I love that stuff. thing. And, you know... Um, and you know he had a big he had a big story for it and it was it was such a cool fun way to play because you're superhuman but you're old school superhuman right you know you're not in the big flashy widescreen authority era you're in you know the shadow and you know all that kind of stuff and it, and of course the comic book uh planetary was out at the time yeah and with that delved into that old school stuff and so it just made sure so much sense and it was such a really great really great book um it was just a shame that they didn't support it 
It was like they released it and was like, okay, cool, here you go. We're not going to give you a player's guide or a storyteller's guide. Yeah. You know, we're done. And I always thought that that was lame. But um, the, but as far as the, the idea of going big is concerned, that was always kind of the big thing when I brought up Scion. Yeah. Was, was like, okay, cool. Because I knew that Scion had this completely like it had completely overhauled the entire white wolf system and i don't know if it was pre if scion was before the new world of darkness came out I'm not sure or if it was after i mean i knew it was after end of days yeah i'm not for sure if they if it was before they started to do the overhaul or right around the same time yeah i don't remember but um i i know that it was the first product that i had seen that it introduced defense values and yeah. prairie values and, um, you know, and had introduced the wheel, which is just such a oh, genius yeah. way of handling such the combat. A, I'm such a big advocate of that. Yeah. Man. And, you know, um, but the cool thing was is that with that game, I knew that you would be able to at least potentially kind of get what you needed out of it. Yeah. Um, Without going... Without yeah. going too big, yeah, and I think that's the thing is what I in in but but the I will say that as a disclaimer, the the weird thing about as opposed to any other White Wolf game, where yeah okay if you play a vampire they they start you off generally at what like thirteenth generation and then you can lower yeah. it, um you can get down to I think about eighth eight yeah and then you and then there are rules in like dark ages for going lower mm -hmm. because obviously you're playing way back in yeah, history the Sabbat, and stuff the guide to the Sabbat, Sabbat I think yeah. released the age um background as well as some of the other stuff so that you could sure really crank it up a bit but you never you never thought of like a Methuselah or an antediluvian as something or that like caliber mm -hmm. to be something you could ever think of in a player character mm -hmm. it was always like those were the the, the the slumbering bats yeah. that were behind the the behind the mastermind behind the mastermind. Uh, they're so you know you knew that eventually if you had to face those it was pretty much your face facing a demon yeah. and that you would probably die unless you could really pull something crazy out. Yeah. Um, and it should never really happen except once in a whole campaign. Sure. So when we talk about you know you and I being more DC fans of the level of power at least. Um, you know, with amping it up, you know, really high power characters, power players. Um, that was, at Aber, that was almost kind of a crutch when I started playing my my game based around my, my book series of Demigods is because Aberrant is such an amped up system yeah. if you play it like you and I play it. And, yeah. you know, so I'm making these characters doing what I want them to do, but then I'm seeing them pull off stuff. And I'm like, okay, I won't go down this, you know, I'll try Scion, but I was like, Scion looks way, Scion has three levels as hero demigod and god which is as opposed to like a vampire you could yeah you can get down to eighth generation and be an elder mm -hmm. but you can all do that in the same book yeah and they give you the abilities well the vampire player's guide you had to get the ones past five yeah but i mean you can pretty much at five five fifth level or five dots in any discipline their powers is more than enough to handle most yeah, it's things. Outlandish. Yeah, when you get to like six, but, it's yeah. like why? Why even bother? Yeah, six. That was the same way in Aberrant when they started releasing like the quantum six oh, and higher yeah. powers, and you're like you're looking at like you know uh, was it Quantum Inferno that yeah. did something like uh, quantum times five base and then power rating times twenty. Yeah, you know dice, and you're like what? Yeah, elemental like, mastery and terraforming. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you're know, like I'm just like, reach doing planets. Why? why yeah. I mean, what, at that point, if you're gonna play a, a game of all those characters, that'd probably be cool. Yeah, but but yeah, if you have a character whose power is universe creation, <laughs> yeah. like that's that's yeah. a little crazy. Yeah, as a game master, that's just asking for game suicide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was always kind of the thing was that like when we first started playing. Um, and I was playing my character Lowell and I kept kind of telling you and you, you were like no man we, we got to jack this up and I was like no we don't I was like trust me dude like we got to keep this on the DL yeah you know like Vic and Lowell they need to be at the very most bare bones bottom yeah rung and you kept trying to say well you know I think you should have Mega Strength of 2 and I'm like no I think I should have no. Mega Strength of 1 <laughs> and you're like no I think you should and I'm like ah, but then but then, you know. I, but then when we went to the Scion and I was like okay 
I'm not going to do because the one downside about Scion, the Scion powers in the hero level, the 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 I'm just learning my that I'm a god or a divine in mm. some way. Their powers aren't all that great, yeah. and they're they're in their entry level powers, and as opposed to the other books where you can go up to like a, the equivalent of an elder, which would be like demigod in that status, they have a whole other book for that. Mm. You know, once you get to God, it's ridiculous. But yeah. then, I'll, but then when even then when you made your your character um, uh, Draken, and then you made um, uh, Matt's uh, character mm. uh, Kalen, and you're like, and I'm looking them over because I made all the other characters of the mm. game. And I'm like looking him over, and I'm like, "Dude, you have no no powers. You yeah. have all like these epic stats, which yeah. are like the equivalent of like the mega stats in Aberd, but like on a lower key." Yeah. And I'm like, "That's all you've got is a shit ton of these. What are you gonna do with this?" And you're like, "No, no, no, it's good." I'm like, "Don't you want powers? No, 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 it's good." Yeah. And then I saw you bring it to bear in the first couple games. Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Oh my god." It's genius because yeah. you can bring to bear these this raw ability of this character that. Uh, and, and albeit, I will say to your benefit, you have eons more of role playing experience to bring story to a character yeah. than the other players that I, that we play with in our in our groups. Yeah. Other than you and I, we're basically the the two two game masters that mm-hmm. play. Um, so you're bringing a lot more awesome story to the character, even though you know we've talked about you doing kind of a subordinate um, element to the other characters mm-hmm. to bring their stories out. Um, but you still, you know, you wrecked a whole nightclub. Yeah. In a scene. Yeah. You know, I'm throwing vampires at you and I'm all like, oh, this is so badass, vampires. Yeah. And you're like, nah, son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to smack him around with my big hammer. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. And then you're like, yeah, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to smack down these pillars, these support beams. I'm like, right. oh. Next thing you know, the whole place is wrecked. And you're like, yeah, how about them apples? Yeah. And I'm yeah. all like, you only got a level two in your powers, yeah. but you have all these badass abilities. Yeah, well, a lot of it is because you know especially after having run aberrant for as long as i did was that one of the things that i learned very quickly is that um from the few opportunities i had from other game masters who had said hey i'm running an aberrant game would you like to play and i would say hell yeah (laughs) and then they would you know and then i'd say what kind of character do you want uh, are you going to make and they would be like no no no, you're going to make your own character and you know, to me, that's crazy because I always build characters. I don't, I don't yeah. trust players to yeah. make characters. Yeah. Um, and so it would always be like, yeah, go ahead, make your make yourself a character. And I'd say, okay. And they'd say, but you know what? Why don't you give yourself an extra twenty dots to <laughs> to you know to round them out with? Because our players have been playing for about two years, and you'll probably. You know, you're, you'd be a little low on the XP range. And I'd always go, are you sure? Because I can make do with the bare bones. I can I can right. make I can make a by-the-book character, and I can make him rock. And he'd be like, nah, it's cool. Just have just have some extra 20 dots. No big deal. Okay, and I'd write that down. And then I'd sit at home, and I'd start looking up the, the, the stuff, and I would think, okay, what's my theme? What, what am I going to build? And then I would start thinking it over and then eventually it would come to me what I want to build, the kind of character that I feel like I can commit to for this game because that's my big thing is that, you know, when I build a character for a game, I want to be married to that character. I don't yeah. want to I don't want to play three, four games and realize, eh, I don't like this. Yeah. I want to play something that I know I'm going to fall in love with and I'm going to stay in love with. And so, you know, finally I'd figure it out and I would build the character, and especially in Aberrant, I would turn around and I would present the character, and the GM would be like, you've got body modification of adhesive grip and fur, and you've got prehensile feet, That those, that's your only powers? And I'm like, yeah. But if you, know, if you notice, I've got you know every mega attribute at at least two, yeah. you know, and I spent literally all those points buying enhancements. Yeah. And so, and skills. Yeah. And so my character was just front loaded with everyday ability, mm-hmm. just natural capability. And, you know, and I learned very quickly that if you have characters that are more heavily power based mm-hmm. than they are with the fundamentals, then inevitably those powers are going to fail them because 
you know, story. Yeah. You know, sometimes having a character that can shoot laser beams is just not what the game needs. And when that happens, a GM is not going to hesitate to bring out negation. Mm -hmm. And the second that they shut your powers down, you go from being juggernaut to Professor X with Mm -hmm. no, Mm -hmm. no superpowers. You're just a dude in a wheelchair. Yeah. You know, have fun. Yeah. And for me, it was always, I can deal with not being able to fly at Mach 5, um, you know, without having force fields and, you know, laser beams and all that stuff. I can deal with that. What I want is a character that's capable. And when I choose to uh, be more than capable, I want the ability to do that. Sure. Sure. You know, um, and so when I built the characters for your Scion game, it was kind of that 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 kind of philosophy behind it of saying, well, all these powers are really great. They're all well and good, even though I don't really like most of the powers in that book. <laughs> but you know, they're yeah. fine. They, yeah. they're, they're 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 there to do what they're there to do, and and I, I respect that. But there's just not many that I need. Yeah. And I kept thinking to myself, well, uh, the fire, you know, I'd like to be able to create fire. Yeah. I'd like to be immune to fire. That's always handy. So I'll just take the first two dots and fire. And then I saw ice and it was like, well, okay. Cool. You know, yeah. I'll take first dot and ice so I'm immune to cold. And then I saw war and I was like, okay, I yeah. have an erection. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so then I took war and I was like, okay, though that's, that's the one thing that I know I'm going to need. Yeah. And... So I took the hell out of that, and then I said, screw it. I don't need any of this other jazz. I'm going to pump it all into my <laughs> epic stats so that when I choose to bring the thunder, there's no doubt who's who's you know who's yeah. bringing it. And so, you know, um, like that was always kind of my approach to it. And I know that the other player, Matt, he's been around long enough that he knows that when I build a character... I'm building a solid character. Yeah. You know, and so he knew at least enough to, you know, not complain yeah. and be like, well, you know, I know this character is badass. I just right. maybe haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. yeah. But. Well, and, and I think that in in talking about White, White Wolf in general, and not just Scion, but um, the, whole, the whole White Wolf, Onyx publishing that whole line is that. Um, in D and D, you a storyteller who plays uh, is always well. Generally speaking, unless a storyteller is playing for a specific uh, underlying motive, like vengeance against a player that's mm. been screwing them over in their game or whatever, which you've heard all those horror stories. Yeah. But if a storyteller plays, you know, I know you and I are both of the mindset that when we go to play a game, when I play in yours, you play in mine we're both trying to elevate the group as a whole mm-hmm. into telling, like you said, epic stories, epic things that we can w- talk about later on and and relish in, in remembering these things when they happen yeah. um, that will hopefully last the test of time. And um, But uh, in White Wolf, as opposed to, say, D&D, where in D&D we're all... The, the structure, it's a very structured game and it's very big on the stats and the dice rolls and all that yeah we could try to bring in some story to it we could try to bring some personality to the characters i know when i've ran in other people when i've had players that were in my group run D D games and try their hand at, at dming you know i always tried to make characters that were unique i always pick the character that the, none of them would ever think they're like oh you're gonna play a wizard because mm-hmm. you always like be the smart guy and i'm like no i'm gonna play a bard I'm going to play a half-orc bard. I'm going to play the weirdest character you can throw out. I've seen you do it in mine, too, but, um, you know, like you were telling me about, like, an adventure playing, like, the mad scientist character. Mm. Stuff that, you know, people would be like, really? That's what you're going to play? You're like, yeah, I'm going to try this out because it sounds like a lot of fun to me. Yeah. And I never see... And it's usually always something that we never see anybody else play or try. That we're like, try this out. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're like, oh, that would be so badass to us. Yeah. And so... But in White Wolf, what's really cool about this, the system is the fact that because it is a storytelling, it's so heavy on the story, so heavy on the role playing. Um, even though statistically the characters can become very sound, and the way I know the way like you make characters, the way I make characters, we see a middle ground somewhere, but we both make them differently. 
ultimately I've seen players in both of our games um, who aren't the, the, the dungeon masters or the storytellers like you and I are um, still come up with some amazing um, stories uh, deep within their creativity yeah. that stuff that I never would have thought some of these players, especially newer players, had ever seen, you know, yeah. or would be able to pull out. And I think that's what's really cool about it is, is that it's because it does, yeah, the stats are there and a little bit more in Scion, obviously, a lot more in Scion than, than in the World of Darkness. But I, I feel that, like, there is generally, in general speaking, there is that urge for players to really just kind of tell what their characters are doing mm -hmm. rather than wor wondering. Can I do this? Can mm -hmm. I do this dice roll? Can I, I? I've seen him once in a while say, "Can I pull out this power in this unique way?" But that's always the cool thing about it. Is yeah. It's always, "Can I take something the book's given me and twist it a little bit and use it?" And they're always like, "If if you say no, I get it." Yeah. But we're always like, "Yeah, do that." That's. Yeah. I mean, most of the time, unless they're trying to do something stupid, crazy, we're like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah. Yeah. The I I think that the. One of the most important things for White Wolf and White Wolf players is that the creativity that can go into every action and every chain of actions that you choose to do is so important. Um, and it's so elevated from a lot of the other systems. You know, you play... And, and you know it sounds like we're shitting on D&D &D, but we're really not no not but the at thing all. is, is that, yeah you know but the thing is is that you know you play D&D &D, yeah and you get what is it utility action move action standard action mm -hmm. and everything is broken down into those chunks and that's yeah. that you know you don't get to say I want to run up and I want to you know chop this dude in the, in the head and then roll forward chop the other dude in the knee and then when I get up, I want to swing my sword around and hit the other guy in the crotch. You don't get to do that because that disobeys the rules. Well, or you have to level up enough you can. Yeah. There's always like, well, I can eventually do that. Sure, sure. But, you know, but the thing is, is I mean, you know, how many games run to ultimate completion in D&D? &D? Yeah. You know, I didn't. Um, yeah, very few ever do. I mean, we got up to level 12. And we petered out. Yeah, I think I petered out. My guys were around 15. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and I'm sure there's hardcore gamers out there who have gotten up to level 30 or whatever the new peak is in 5th edition. Yeah. But the thing is, is that, you know, the amount of creativity that you can put into your actions, into everything about your game, you know, because it's set in the kind of in a marginally realistic now world. Yeah. You can essentially take whatever your knowledge is, and as long as you're not metagaming, you can apply that to your character and say, I'm going to go here and I'm going to talk to this. Like when we were, uh, we were playing Demon the other day, yeah. Demon the Fallen, and our other player was floundering, and he was trying to figure out what to do, and you were being stubborn. And we're basically like, I'm not going to do anything because I've led this group since day one. Yeah. And now you guys have to do something on your own. And finally you were like, okay, fine. And you just came out with the most obvious thing where you were like, yeah, I've, you know, can I have a guy who I talk to who knows stuff about knowing stuff? And it, it, do I have that guy? And I said, yeah, you know, his name is Billy the tits. Yeah. And you're like, okay, cool. I'm calling yeah. Billy the tits. And I'm like, all right, sweet. Yeah. And so then boom, you move the story along in a heartbeat. And the funny thing is that the other player, he would never have thought of that. That would have never come to, you know, come to him. He would have just floundered and floundered and floundered until finally he would have just turned to me and said, I don't know what to do. Right. And I would have had to say, okay, fair enough. Yeah. You know, let me help you. Here's here's some yeah. stuff that you can do. Here's some people you can talk to. Okay, cool. You know, but that's the cool thing about it is that if you choose to interact with your environment and you choose to build on your environment in this game, you can. And you can do it with as much creativity as you choose. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's one of the great things about it. You know, and, and I'm sure that a lot of other games do support that kind of thinking, but... Not many, you know. Not in the same way that that the world of darkness does. Not right. in the same way that 
it's it's different iterations scion and even Avern is as as, as stat heavy as it is about because it's a fair superhero combat yeah. uh cape and cowl i mean they're they're still like so much like they give you enough to make of uh, the ability to make amazing things happen mm-hmm. but they don't tell you concretely how to use it they mm-hmm. say here's the basics of what we should say you can do with it mm-hmm. and some people would argue well yeah but technically they do they say you know if you roll this and this stat this many successes this is what happens mm-hmm. but if if and maybe this just comes with game mastering as long as both you and i have i think the reason that we like the system so well and what we try to push it off on other people to really try is because of the fact that um and like you said we're not crapping on dnd but dnd i know like when you have a spell and it you say my wizard cast burning hands there's a finite range there's a finite number of damage mm-hmm. There's a finite thing. There's even people that have the ability to counter said finite spell. Mm -hmm. And if you go online and say, can I use it like this? The forums are flooded with rule lawyers saying, no, 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 no. Wizards of the Coast say blank. Where if you have, say, like, I think it's called like Lure of the Flame or the one for um, the the Thaumaturgical one. Mm -hmm. Um, Or, you know, any number of variants of the different... uh, uh, of the different um, books, if you have something that's similar, like a flame-based ability, they may give you the stats and the range and the generals, and but they they always talk in the fiction. They always talk in the different ways about how you can try to be creative with that power and use it in various um, utilities that you would never think of. You know, yeah, you can damage people with it, but you know, doing something as simple as hey. I'm not just going to shoot fire out of my hands at these orcs. Oh, well, I'm standing, there's a bunch of guys, you know, mafioso guys getting ready to shoot at me, but there's a couple of propane tanks sitting beside them, mm-hmm. you know? Um, then there happens to be an oil spill that drips right real close to me. I can just kind of flick off a little bit of flame yeah. and go over to them and see if I can do something with that. It, it promotes the idea of being creative because there is a level of supernatural, obviously, the whole thing, but there's a level of realism and science and reality that mm-hmm. we live in. And even if you run it in Dark Ages, even if you run it in, like, the Old West with the, the werewolf one, um, it's almost like you want to try to better understand how you can use your environment. It's like Jackie Chan role-playing, yeah. using everything around you. Yeah, you know, well, some, and, peop- and some people don't. But yeah, you know, yeah, that's, that, that's very true. It's something that always kind of bugged me because when I'm in a game, like my my first, like for example, when we were playing Big and Lowell in your yeah. thing, it wasn't about using our powers. It was about using everything in our environment to make things happen. Yeah, and to have fun with it, you yeah. know, and to. To actually be verbal as opposed to, you know, just being these sullen, you know, super badasses who, right, right. who just kick ass and take names, you know, and... You you're know, less like doing... You're less like Angry Dean and Sam. Yeah. And more like goofy, just you. I yeah. mean, you know, there's lots of quips. There's yeah. lots of like, you know, you're grabbing onto like random weird lamprey vampiric yeah. you know Asian people and being like oh, yeah. you know yeah. nasty and yeah. you're like all these really funny interactions yeah. that I thought was fantastic yeah you know because it was it was about having a good time and you know but also about using the environment and you know because I think that a lot of players especially folks who are weaned on D&D and on uh, maybe some other games like, uh, like GURPS I know is kind of uh, another one of those where you do kind of come up with this um, kind of expectation that your sword and your shield and your armor, these are intrinsic parts of you. Yeah. You know, that they are as much a part of you as your thumb. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, if those things get taken away from you, then your character is virtually helpless. Yes. And... You know, and so then when you bring him into a game like White Wolf, which can be gear heavy if you choose to make it, but we've never really run a gear heavy game. No. 
that you kind of have to get to the point where you recognize that you know every man in this game is an island into and of, of himself and he's got it or she has got to be the one who takes care of his stuff they can't rely on you know the magic sword the vorpal sword plus three no. they can't rely on you know all the the rings and staves and you know portable holes and all the other mm -hmm. stuff you know they've got to deal with the this stuff with their own two hands and their wits and i know that you know a lot of the first rookie players who come over to white wolf especially from uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, all those things who've never really played in White Wolf, they do tend to flounder for the first few games before you have to sit down with them and have that conversation of just saying, you know, I can see that you have it in you, mm. that you want to do all this stuff, and you keep wondering, can I do that stuff? Mm. But you're asking the wrong question. The right question is, why am I not doing yeah. all of this stuff? You know, like, th there's nothing inhibiting you. Yeah. The only thing that's inhibiting you is the physics in your own head that tell you how this character operates. You know? Well, and I think that on that point, um, you have... Uh, and this is something you and I have always been against, is we... Up until recently, you... You know way more about the um, intricacies, the cosmology, the politics of White Wolf canon. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, read, I read the basics, I read the kind of understanding, and I would read the fiction. Sure. To kind of get a better feel for the genre, but I always did homebrew. I mm -hmm. never went by the book, ever. No. And um, so, you know, if there was something, you know, I, you, like you said, you know, it took a long time. And one of the things you pointed out earlier was the fact that it would take, at least in our games, a long time to ever find out who the canon prince of a city would be. Mm -hmm. I never had that because I really didn't care. Yeah. Um, but, and I know that this is, this is really big right now is the, and my wife and I have discussed this at a great length, is um, mods. And, and, and all the modules that come out for D and D, um, that's what a lot of people run, mm -hmm. and that can be kind of a downside. I will say, as much as you and I tote White World of Darkness, and I would still suggest it to anybody, it would be something that would be a little bit of an eye opener for somebody who's wanting to run the game. Mm -hmm. Is that you? You can go by what the books have, and, and there is so much, mm -hmm. so much. And what's nice about it is it's been out for so long that if you really want to go with like the second editions, the older ones, mm -hmm. you can buy them. You can buy them on the cheap. Yeah, that's the great thing about it is you PDFs. can buy it from beginning to end. Yeah, and you have the complete show. There's oh, yeah. no, there's no ifs or buts. You buy the twentieth anniversary editions, and they throw everything into it. Everything, you know. Yeah. So you don't have to sit here and go digging around for old no, stuff. No, it's all there. Yeah, it's it's there waiting for you. But you, but if you want the one thing that it, that the creators of White Wolf even really pushed was always for you to. Take what you want from it, and mm -hmm. then leave the rest. Yeah, and and I think that as a as a game, um, as a role playing experience, that's the what's the, the joy is for you and I is to take you know a chance to let people be re truly creative with what they have. Like you said, letting them do those things that they want to do but they're scared to do because they're so used to having to play. Um, by the mods, mm -hmm. by the rules. I, I mean, I, I meet people all the time, all the time that are into gaming because I kind of wear it on my sleeve and they'll be like, you know, oh, that's an awesome shirt with a dragon on. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I play with Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. And they're like, or I used to, or, you know, I still do. And they're like, oh, well, I'm in this part of this mod. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but man, that's awesome that you're playing. Yeah. Because I, I just don't. And I'm not doubting people that do because I have a lot of friends that do. But at the same time, that's the whole... And I don't want to say that White Wolf is superior in that way. If that's the type of game that you like, awesome. But I think that this is a chance, and maybe as you and I being the type that You get that your are, storytelling chops. Right. In, you know, because as great as mods can be... Yeah. They, they do essentially put you in training wheels, and they, they, they walk you through it. There's you always know. it's written out for you what to do yeah. if if things go off the rails. Yeah, if things go here. Yeah, and if, and you know, and you really get your improv chops by playing a game like White Wolf, 
where, you know, um, you know, some people will sit down and they'll write the entire game out, you know, and, you know, and that's, that's perfectly cool. You know, um, I'm of the, the, the opinion that you should write down a couple of bullet points of things that you need to have happen for your own plot line. And then everything else should be story based on whatever the characters yeah. uh, feel like doing. And all my job is, is to kind of corral them every now and again to yeah. try and put people on the right path and, you know, and then to provide narration and, and, you know, uh, and expand on environment and all that kind of crap. But, you know, like, uh, I think that one of the most important things for anyone who game masters, whether they're playing D and D or they're playing GURPS or they're playing Godlike or they're playing, you know, mutants and masterminds, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I think that the most important thing that you can do is to sit down, come up with a story idea, come up with a defined ending, an event that you want to happen. And then write down a couple, three or four bullet points that say characters need to interact with this character to find out this information. Boom. Okay, now we're off the races. Now that information pays off in this way. Boom. You know, and then that situation then leads to this, which then pays off in this scenario here. And then that scenario leads directly into the ending. And then sit th three people down and say... Uh, I'm going to run a storyline that I created. Uh, I need you to help me out. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and work with me and let's see where it goes. And then have that game master sit down and say, you wake up. It's Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in your pajamas and you're embarrassed because they're SpongeBob SquarePants pajamas and you're 40 years old. <laughs> You know, what are you going to do with your day? And you watch them go from there. And then once they start maneuvering and they start doing their thing, you tell them what their job is, what they love, what they hate, all this stuff. You go into the movies. This movie's coming out tonight. You're super hyped to see it. You got a little extra cash. You go see the movie. You're super hyped. You leave. And then all of a sudden in the alleyway, you watch someone, you know, bite some chick in the neck. And you're like, what in the... Yeah. And you see the girl goes down like a ton of bricks after a couple of minutes. And the dude looks at you, and he's really pale, and he's got the one single silly droplet of blood yeah. coming down his chin, yeah. you know, because he's a goon, and, you know, he's a... Slop sloppy eater. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. And, you know, okay, so what are you going to do? Yeah. And, and let the storyteller kind of get their chops by having players say, okay, well, I'm going to go do this. Yeah. And then you have to invent characters on the fly. Yeah. You know, you have to invent scenarios on the fly and you have to, you know, you have to really keep those gears cranking as to what this situation is going to do to this situation and that situation and this situation. And you, ha you, you know, because the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that when you're a game master like you are and like I am, where you're a butterfly effect game master. Mm -hmm. And you're just consistently adapting to every single move that gets done while understanding that I'm going to put you in this scenario sooner or later. Yeah. We can dance around it all day. I don't care. Yeah. But sooner or later, you're going to get here. And then once you get here, you're going to find out what all of this tomfoolery prior to that has now led to. Yeah. And then once you're there, you're going to see the results of that butterfly flapping its wings, you know, mm -hmm. in Wyoming and, you know, in Thailand, you know, Got six lady up. boys, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, you know, and so you're going to have game masters who are obviously terrified of that. Yeah. And, and I think it's perfectly natural because I know I was terrified of it when I was a rookie. Now it's oh, second yeah. nature. Me it's too. not that big of a deal. Yeah. But when I sit down with other uh, game masters and I say, you know, don't write it all out. Just write up some bullet points. Yeah. Create a couple of characters. If you need to waste paper on them, cool. If you if you can keep them in your head, even better. Don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, 
you just come up with general general things you know you're the game master you don't have to worry about stats and I, I think it's safe to say that if you're in combat it's fair to use stats sure um, even if you just kind of keep them in your head you know um, but you know to be honest about that well I think that's what's nice about Wild Wolf too is that the way combat works is the way the skills work yeah everything's the same yeah and D D, it's kind of like that too but it's really not yeah they really separate skills from, from combat. combat yeah it's a total yeah you know, yeah they roll the same dice and generally they should be the same but they're very very different yeah different way you add up numbers different outcomes the way that combat works pretty much the same way that skills work almost yeah. exactly yeah and it can even you can even be creative with your combat mm-hmm. if and and they promote that yeah yeah, I mean, I remember when, uh, what was that movie with uh, uh, John Travolta and uh, the greatest actor of our generation? Nicolas Cage? Yeah. Face Off? Yeah. Yeah. I remember because the gunplay in that made all of your guys lose their shit for like eight oh, months. Yeah. Everyone yeah. had twin guns at their back. Oh, oh yeah. And, uh, you know, there were doves flying every time. <laughs> That, yeah, that they walked into a yeah, room, yeah. you know, there was just crazy shit, and it was like, you know, yeah. and, it, and it was cool because you saw them doing John Woo style gunfights, uh-huh. and you were you were playing along with them, and you sure. were like, okay, cool, if this is what you want to do, cool, yeah, you know, I was running Dark Age at the time, so the there best, uh, yeah, yeah, the best you could have like two guys with bow and arrows being <laughs> being super cool or whatever, yeah. you yeah. know, but but yeah, like you know, I, I feel like that was. You know that that's one of the great things about the, this game is that, you know, I mean, you know, with, with any game you can pull, you know, visual reference from film or television sure. or, or whatever, but with the storyteller system, you can get to this um, golden goose of immersion that yeah. so many people are clamoring for these days yes you know you hear about immersion constantly from other yes. game masters who are going on and on and on about immersion and, and i i don't i don't discount immersion i think that that immersion is a great thing but it's also the kind of thing that if you don't worry about it it'll happen like you don't have to you don't have to sit down with your players and say now I care about immersion. Right. I need you to be entirely 150% <laughs> invested yes. in this character at every moment yes. of the game. I need this for immersion. No, well, you can just sit yeah. down and say play the character as you it see. It doesn't them. have to be a dangling carrot yeah. in front of their face. And I think that's kind of a, and I think that becomes a problem, you know, as a game master is because you are, you're telling them how they should be. And you're telling them you should be at this level. Mm -hmm. And that instantly creates a level of anxiety for the players. They instantly separate from, (laughs) from, from getting immersed into yeah. the character because now they're worried about how their their job performance well yeah and they're worried about what people are saying what people are thinking yeah why you, know? you bring this up to yeah, me? yeah because the first time that that one player at the table decides to cop a goofy accent everyone starts giggling because they're being goofy yeah you know but they're thinking of of you know well i want to invest myself in this character but you know you just finding a whole crew that's willing to go that far yeah. is almost impossible, you know, and yeah, you know, and immersion, I think immersion is something that every game master should hope for, mm-hmm. but trying to uh, invest, you know, or, or burn calories, trying to make it happen is pointless. No. Yeah. So now we're going to switch up gears a little bit. Okay. Um, so what I was thinking is um, kind of uh, get into before we end it, uh, talking about, we've already talked about the storyteller system and uh, toted 
its um, its pros and given a few cons, but I really like to get a little bit more specific with um, introducing White Wolf to our listeners um, and on a personal level find out from you and then go you know back and forth to me maybe about what um, in particular let's say if of all the characters I know you haven't got to play you're like me you don't get to play as much as you'd like mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of the, the bane of the storyteller yeah. um, is that you know if you're really good at it you just love storytelling but you love playing too you just don't get to do it as often as you want to um, if, if you could play or if, if you've had a character that you've played and I know which one you've played in my game mm -hmm. is there a certain character that you like the best um, or is there a character that you would you know is there a type of uh, games say like werewolf mage wraith all of them demon that you would like to play that you haven't played and, and why or is there one that you find more enjoyable as a player I think and why as far as characters are concerned um, it it's hard for me to distinguish between them because I love every character that I've ever played. Yeah. I mean, being able to play Chun was uh, my kindred to the East. Uh, he was a bone, or a, what are they called? Uh, the Lotus, the death oriented mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Um, and uh, I loved playing that character, um, you know, as kind of primitive as he was at the time, just because he's. He, he's so it, it's fun to play a character that can be a stark raving chauvinist yeah. and yet at the same time his kind of sole purpose in the group is ultimately to defend everyone in that group whether they are you know man woman child werewolf vampire whatever you sure. know his his purpose is to you know keep everyone alive um and i loved having the opportunity to play the character um and being able to kind of flesh him out um was just so much fun um well i know you've brought him over to your to your modern day that we're playing yeah and to see as an npc and to see him you know, when, when when Mel and I started playing in the white the, the new one that you've got and you got to see the character mm -hmm. in action again, it was as from my viewpoint as a storyteller that I got to see that character come to life. It was really enjoyable to see um, what you, in your mind as the creator of the character what he, you thought he would be like mm -hmm. twenty years from now, yeah. and to see the character advance that far and, and see you know if he had twenty years of life to perfect his form perfect his chi mm -hmm. powers all these different things and see him progress as basically uh, the full demon yeah and all, all this mythos that you had created about the character yeah. too yeah yeah you know, because, was, was fantastic yeah because a lot of the stuff was stuff that i had in mind way back when but when you're in a group of seven eight guys oh yeah you know asking for spotlight just to kind of uh kind of have a little bit of masturbatory moment just doesn't no. just doesn't happen yeah and you know but uh i had a character in aberrant uh who is one of my flagship characters his name is uh promethean and he is a firestorm analog um and firestorm is my favorite character yeah. of all time so like i loved being able to play that that was really fun um because he was a he was essentially a terrorist um he was a, a good guy no doubt but the stuff that he did was very much opposed to the society in which he was living in and um when you have a character who can rearrange matter and build technology high end technology like it was nothing yeah and then you have that character basically say why are people starving you know why are people you know struggling to put gas in their car to get to work why are people worried about food and shelter and warmth and water you know these are all things that should be intrinsic to being alive at this point we live in a world that is a wealthy table yeah 
and yet there are people who are only getting scraps yeah, and sure. playing a character who was politically motivated to make sure that you know no matter what the government or the world or the media was saying about you that you had the power to actually do something about it it was a really liberating character sounds to play, amazing yeah you know because you yeah, you become a bad guy, but not because you want to, but because you're made into yeah, a bad guy. You're working guy. against everything that yeah. is being fed. Yeah, and you know, and the cool thing was is that I was fortunate enough to have players who played with me, who could see what I was doing, what mm-hmm. I had in mind, sure. and then they stepped up to fill roles that they knew that I couldn't necessarily fill. And and so we had this dynamic of about three or four different characters who were suddenly up against the world and were of such a... It's not that, that our power levels were o- overwhelming but it was the way that we chose to apply our capabilities made us almost impossible to deal with. Sure. One on one as a group, we were virtually untouchable. And you know, and it made so it made for such fun uh, role playing. Yeah. As opposed to just action, 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 yeah. kill, kill, kill. Like you could really do some cool role playing because, you know, you were playing in a game of ideologies. Yeah. And, you know, and you knew that you were morally on the right track, but socially you were as far off as you could conceivably be. Sure. And, you know, and that was a blast. Um, I, uh, I played uh, two characters in the adventure game with uh, our other game master, Sean Barry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one was uh, just a guy called the Russian. Yeah. And he was a mad scientist and um I absolutely adored playing that character. But the problem with that character was that <clears throat> I was playing a character that was essentially like being Superman in a Spider Man story. Mm. Like uh the the level that I was playing on was a little bit higher than the level that the other players were playing at. Because most of them, it's not that they were rookies, um, but they were street-level characters. Yeah. And I was playing a character that was like, you know, that, that was like, hey, we're being attacked by a robot. Give me 30 seconds, I'm going to build an electromagnet gun that's going to take this thing down. Yeah. You know? Um, I think, uh, so when I remember you telling me this, the stories about it, I think one of the things that I, I noticed that it, it's hard, it's one of the, I think it's one of the reasons that it's kind of intimidating for other people to want to suggest running games when they've been running in your game. Mm-hmm. Yours or mine. The universal you, not yeah. you specifically. Uh, as a storyteller is because you storytellers especially like you and me that play very impromptu Mm -hmm. uh we can't think on our feet with what we have available to us and we try to yeah we try to be creative with the minimum with a minimal amount of effort yeah uh and and it's almost a second nature because we're so used to having to think on our feet with six you know anywhere from three to six to eight other people around the table all throwing different shit at us yeah and when like you were telling me about that that time, you were like, I was like, wow, you know, you took a, ki-, you know, when you said they were talking about that beforehand, oh, you know, they're telling Sean Phil's gonna kill with this character, yeah. Fuzz is gonna destroy with this character, and he's like, oh no no no, and then you did, yeah, and it's because you're giving a char- you know, you're giving us a, a character that has an infinite sandbox, yeah, you know, a, a, a mad scientist can take everything around him and turn it in MacGyver yeah. it into whatever he yeah. wants to. Yeah. And probably can pull it off with the dice rolls. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. 
And then I kind of built a, uh, a, a second character for that game once I realized that, that the, the Russian character just wasn't working. Yeah. Um, and so then what I did was I, I started thinking to myself, like, I, I really liked the Batman animated series. Oh, yeah. And I thought Absolutely. that was kind of cool. But I also like um, this old TV show and book series about... Uh, the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, an old Disney. Um, yeah, it was an old Disney show about a guy who was a vicar during the day, and then at night he was a vigilante who dressed up like a scarecrow and had a really gravelly voice, and he beat up bad guys and he did all kinds of cool stuff. And it's a series from like 1915. Sure, and it's very. When you read it, it's very much like chip, chip, cheerio, good sir. Yeah, you know all yeah. that kind of stuff, and you know, uh, but it's it was really cool, and I kept thinking to myself like, I would like to play a character who is kind of a dynasty, um, who was just the newest version of a character that had been around forever. Sure, and sort of like a, a the Phantom kind of right. thing where right. it's just a it's the same character but different people passing the torch yeah. from the, the one generation to the next and so we sat around with Sean and and to his credit he he invented a lot of the background uh, stuff for it because you know he knew his game better than I ever could sure. and so I just kind of said I want to create a character named Vertigo and I want that character to be a sort of Batman-esque um uh, vigilante but in that character's daytime life it is a woman named Emma Kane mm -hmm. and at night she is the vertigo which is generally considered to be a man mm -hmm. and so she wears all these heavy cloaks and all this sure. other stuff to hide her figure and all this kind of stuff so uh, and during the day, she basically was raised to be a sort of um, Zatanna-style magician mm -hmm. alongside her father figure, who was a um, stage magician. Mm -hmm. And she was being taught to be a stage magician. And so she knew all the tricks. Sure. You know, how to vanish stuff and smoke bombs and all kinds of other silly shit. And then when... She got old enough, she had set up a magic thing of her own, and then what she started doing was creating all these alternate personas for her that would allow her to slip into different environments, like the police is like a... As like a, one of the first generation of like criminal profilers oh, okay. and all kinds of other things so that she could move through the city taking on different personas... Uh, different names, different looks, because you know she grew up with magic, right. so she had wigs and all kinds of stuff. Right. And so she would just change everything, and so I could essentially have the character preparing for shows every weekend. You know, performing at you know the Arcadia City, you know, uh, uh, amphitheater or whatever it may be. Sure. And you know she's got you know a show at eight o'clock on Friday. 8 o'clock on Saturday, and, you know, uh, maybe another one on Monday. So, you know, she's only got like a two-hour stint a night where she's actually working, working. Right. And then the rest of the time, she's a vigilante. And, you know, so when she's in the Vertigo costume, she's the Vertigo character. Very cool. With the gravelly voice, and she's right. super agile, and she's all this crazy stuff. But then the really cool part about her was that as a normal everyday woman she could pursue all of the cool stuff that was going on in the city with all the other games with all the other characters because she had different personas that would allow her to slip in effort effortlessly into other player storylines that's very cool and so then i could offer up whatever it is that i could offer up well, while simultaneously that timeline because yeah. women were it was very I mean, ignored. obviously yeah they're ignored yeah. And, you know was, you know you're your eye candy at best yeah and so you know i i really enjoyed being able to play that character uh and then um even though i i didn't really have a lot of games with it but i had one that Sean had kind of prepared for me that was 
introducing like the supernatural element mm-hmm. into adventure. Yeah. And so it, there was like this kind of crazy voodoo doctor and there oh, were all cool. these spooky owls and undead guys and dudes with like no eyes and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And I just got to roll in and just Batman animate a series, <laughs> just kick the crap out of a bunch of guys sure. and it was it was it was a blast. That's awesome. Um That sounds great. It yeah. sounds like a cool character. Yeah, and then like um after that there was a couple of other characters that I played that I didn't really uh, that, that were more or less just designed to be support role characters um, that I didn't really have any um, any stake in. Uh, they were in more o- more often than not, it was a game master who knew that I played and w- or and that I ran games yeah. and would say, "Hey, I'm doing this. Can you come in and play like a one shot, you know, kind of kamikaze character?" Sure. All right. Cool. And then um, when you started running uh, your Scion game. Yeah. And I played Vic and I played or Lowell for two games. Yeah. Uh, and then when you said, "Yeah, I'm going to play Scion," I was like, "Okay, cool. I want to build a Scion." Yeah. You know, like if you're doing a homebrew thing, I'm cool with playing one of the characters from my novel. But right. you know, if we're going to play the game, the game, the game, yeah, yeah, then I want to build a Scion. Yeah. And so, like, uh, and I really just absolutely love playing draken yeah no he's, um, he's awesome i like being able to go between being that kind of viking berserker to you know being you know the sort of uh cool uncle mm-hmm. kind of character to you know a lot of the other people um okay so let me ask you if you i know right now we're doing um demon the fallen we're kind of moved towards the demon the fallen mm-hmm. game um you know where we had kind of a, a an amalgamation game of, of of all sorts of world of darkness um, is Demon your favorite genre of the White Wolf series to run? Um, or, if you, or if you could say, I really enjoy this, or I've always wanted to try this, I, what would it be if you had the story tell? Um, if it were up to me, what I would like to do, if I could play and have all of you guys in yeah. for a game where it was just all of us and we had some kind of phantom storyteller who could yeah. run the whole story for us yeah i would want to play changing breeds okay i would basically just want to sit down with everyone and say pick one and let's build it i know jim would make an ananasi he's already got a great ananasi character yeah. sebastian who's cool you know i know matt would probably be like yep i want to play summer because why not play a t-rex if yeah. you have the opportunity right, absolutely you know um i love the werewolf cosmology because it's so dense and um, but at the same time, it's also very ill-defined. Yeah. Um, you can kind of make of it what you will. Um, you can really dig deep into the umbral stuff, or you can just leave it alone. Yeah. Um, you can do so many different cool things, but the great thing about that game line is that the the divisions are so clear yeah. between who who is good and who is not. Yeah. And... And also because it has that kind of corporate um, Gordon Gecko style, greed is good yeah. kind of undercurrent beneath everything makes it a kind of liberal lefties kind of dream game where you yeah, get to yeah. take it against like the one percent and you know and all that kind of stuff. Which, You're literally tree huggers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and I think we're that that's, saving nature. Yeah, and I think that that's such a cool kind of noble thing whereas like with vampire you're just sort of ingrained in politics with yeah. mage you're also ingrained in politics with with wraith you're you're basically terrified constantly yeah you're just, you know like you're you, trying to survive yeah even though you're already dead yeah you know and you're you're already way at the shit end of the state yeah and with you know changing changeling it's even more politics but in a, a very ill-defined way yeah. where you know like unless you're willing to sit down and read probably a thousand pages of of changeling material yeah. to try and make sense of it yeah you're just not or you can get just it. go over the general like horrible remorse of the whole thing which is the loss of innocence yeah and just i'm losing my creativity yeah. and i'm now am just another face in the crowd yeah. and I've lost everything. Yeah, and my thing is is that if you want to run that kind of game, that's awesome. 
But how are you going to run that game in a group? And how are you going to ensure that you've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters or players who are willing to play that kind of game and give it the kind of attention and justice that it deserves? Sure. You're going to be hard pressed to find anything. You are. I think that one of the reasons why Demon the Fallen is as superior as it is is because it has a dense history like a vampire does. Yeah. You know, and it has a very important history like vampire does. When you bring in the biblical stuff, it's hard to deny that it's as that it has as much gravitas as it does. And so when you're playing demon and you sit down with your with a player who's unfamiliar with it and you say, "You were present at creation." We're going to begin there. Yeah. And now it's 2017. Yeah. So 14.6 billion years have gone by since the first time you opened your eyes. Welcome to Earth. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's such a cool thing. I mean, your apocalyptic forms are are amazing. Um, the the kind of stories you can tell are yeah, just, you know you can tell brutal stories, you can tell hopeful stories, you can tell everything in between. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and I think that uh, you know what you can get out of it is you can get a lot of mileage out of demon, whereas with vampire, I feel like the mileage that you get out of vampire is potentially going to be spent being more having more anxiety than you need to play for a role playing game. Yeah. You know, um I feel the same way about Mage, even though I, I now I love Mage. I think Mage is great now, but I wouldn't want to run a Mage game just because as interesting as it is, I know that it would take me 6 months to prep the players yeah. as to how this stuff works. Yeah. and try to express that the subtleties of these things are more important than the grandiose things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't run a Changeling game, period, just because it just doesn't appeal to me. Wraith is, again, it's so depressing that I have yeah. a hard time running games. I've seen games being played for Wraith that are fucking incredible, and I've seen game masters who can take that um, that whole genre and twist it into something that is amazing I'm just I'm not that kind of storyteller yeah um, but with like demon demon for me is just right it, it, it's enough of vampire that like I, I have a, a, a very firm foundation with it I understand it but then it also has enough of the kick-ass, you know, high octane, oh, yeah. you know, stuff in it that I can, I can get my yayas out with that, and I can still maintain the kind of game that I want to play. Sure. <clears throat> uh, so, what about you? What's uh, favorite character? Um, of the characters I've ever played, probably especially. It's uh, the White Wolf, a World of Darkness, um, any of those. I, I aberrant uh, Dominion, my Dominion character in Aberrant. Your Aberrant game was always good. Was a good one. You know, I brought him over from um, Jonesy's online wrestling thing. We were into that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that persona? And then I was just like, you know, hey, I can do this cool character that can just kind of be a little bit of a catch-all, like a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, but he was always real high energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I like those type of characters that can that can keep on the move, but um, can always come out, pull something out of their ass mm -hmm. when the group needs to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rasmus, you know, that uh, that I played just recently, and yours was kind of like that, uh, even though he was supposed to be a little bit more low-key in the energy department. Yeah. Um, but Aberrant's high-energy game is a high-energy yeah. game. Yeah, well, and the thing with Erasmus was that, you know, when we came up with the idea of Erasmus first of all putting a kiosk in the game is always you know yeah. I, I mean because I don't understand why they would have created them 
if they don't want you to use them. And right. I was just thought that was sort of so stupid. And the thing that I hate about a lot of the the vampire stuff, especially werewolf, is almost as bad. Is that they stereotype their own characters or their own uh, they stereotype the clans mm -hmm. and the tribes so heavily yeah. that if you say yeah I'm going to have one of my guys play Kiasid who owns a nightclub and you know has a bunch of friends and you know is not your stereotypical Kiasid then people will literally go that's dumb yeah you know that's dumb. You shouldn't. Yeah. You shouldn't do that. Yeah, you're throwing away all this hard work and this canon that you can build off of, yeah. and it's yeah. It, and I think that's kind of, but that's always been kind of a problem for a lot of people, uh, especially back in the day compared to maybe compared to now um, that still play the games is that they rely too heavily on on the canon mm -hmm. as the end all be all of what you can do with your characters. Yeah. I mean, you know, Malkavians. Yeah, we've had some Malkavians in the group that were that were just batshit crazy, mm -hmm. and that's always fun to play a batshit crazy character because it gives you that, that no leash. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more exciting to play a Malkavian character that has where you've, as a player, done the research into certain types of. Um, mental malignance and found out, like say my character is, you know, whether they have multiple personality disorder or whether they have you know, they're manic depressive or whatever, to really research it and try to bring to light that character mm -hmm. because it doesn't have to be just a crazy lunatic yes. every single time. Yeah, like that's always the catch-all with Mulcavians if whenever you see people bringing them to bear, they're always just like, you know, yep, I'm standoffish and weird, but in a fight, I go fucking berserk. Yeah. And it's like, okay, cool. That's cool, but, you know, that's... And now you, 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 like you said, you become a stereotype. Yeah. That, unfortunately, in a way, the, the company's kind of preyed on stuff. Yeah. So. <laughs> the dog, I think, mm -hmm. is just doing cartwheels. Yeah. She's going fucking like berserk. Flipping. Yeah. <laughs> anyway but yeah like um so you got dominion yeah dominion was good um uh you know like i liked erasmus playing him you know moving over to orcus in your demon game um because i wanted the chance to kind of pull back from pushing story forward i you know and, and, I, and I, I wanted like you know i talked to you about i want, want a character that can facilitate cool things but I wanted them to mostly be a brute because yeah. I never really get to play brutes um, unfortunately in the last like 15 years or so I haven't really had a whole lot of people that have that have been willing to step up and storytell or game master um, you know there's been a couple uh, I, I had mostly in D&D &D. Um, you know I had a character that was the half orc bard that was a lot of fun um, because I went I went full tilt to the nines with it I you know the the character they, they asked me what do you want to play mage I said no I'll play a half orc bar they said why in the world did you want to play that and I'm like because I want him to be I want him to be to break all boundaries in this game and mm -hmm. but I'll still I'll still help you move story forward and help you and they're like okay that's cool just don't leave me don't screw my game over yeah and so I I made it where I, I made a guy that a half orc bar that looks like Danzig um if Danzig was back in the medieval times, mm -hmm. and he he as opposed to all the other bards, uh, the the character I figured the bards in his tribe um, would probably be you know mostly percussion you know drums that kind of thing you know you always picture orc big orc war drums and stuff. I wanted him to have been um, trying to find his place, and he didn't. He felt that the drums were not not his um, his shtick so he, he gets he's on a mountaintop and by himself and kind of the whole Moses with the burning bush lightning strikes and he gets he hears the roar of thunder and the gods of metal tell him that he must be the one to discover what metal is mm -hmm. and, and bring it to the masses and uh, he so 
it was perfect because I could have a character that could be could show up in any given situation. He's a wandering minstrel, so he is. He's at the bar at the beginning of the game, and they, um, they're like, okay, so you see this weird green orc guy that has long black hair, kind of a Nathan explosion from Metalocalypse with it in his face, and he walks up and he says, and I'm like, hi, my name is Slardy, and I'm. Um, going to bring a new type of music to you. It's called metal. The gods have bestowed it upon me, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna play right now if that's cool with y'all. And then I, I literally borrowed my son Ben's recorder, mm-hmm. and I started playing this song that I had written a week in advance. <laughs> uh, and then I started playing it, and like, by I didn't tell the storyteller yeah. that or anything. And next, and I didn't tell anybody it. And they say, you know, I'm like playing this recorder song, and it's kind of like my take on, um, on like, um, Mr. Crowley, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm kind of playing this thing, and then I get done with it, and I just kind of look around the, the table, and they just are all like, what the fuck did we just listen to? <laughs> <laughs> so, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That character is, unfortunately, they only played for a few sessions, but that character is a lot of fun. Um, and, then, and then I had a character that I, I'd always wanted to play if I ever got the chance to again that I'd made as an NPC. Um, of course, Lord of the Rings movies came out and they were like, you know, running a D&D game, they're going to be a big influence on what you do anyway. But I always thought that, um, especially in the second movie, uh, or the second Hobbit movie, when they explain... Um, well, maybe it was the second movie, when they explain... Uh, Gollum's background as like mm-hmm. one of the river folk and you know you kind of get see him like start off like Frodo but then go bad and you yeah. know that kind of stuff and you really get to kind of get like a little bit more of a you know I'm a sucker for the um, a kind of anti-hero or a, car- a villain with a with a heart of gold in some fashion you know that you really want to feel like he's got a good side and you know you see inter- literally see the internal struggle of him fighting with himself um so I, I made this character that was called Tufus, and he was he was a uh, a little short run in my campaign where um, they he basically looks like a mummy, kind of wrapped up in all these r- old rags and clothes that are mismatched, and the and he speaks really strange, not like Gollum like where he talks about himself, but he says you know he always talks about the the when he says stuff he says Tufus, and they were trying to figure out what that meant, and they were trying to figure out what he's doing, and you come to find out that he was actually um, a, uh, a prince from a neighboring kingdom that had been mixed up with a ragamuffin. And the ragamuffin had a whole story where it was from, it was kind of a pet of a wizard who had um, done some spells, and he kind of created it as like a little servant around his shop, so it was like this kind of animated clothes, and then... Um, the wizard was old and he eventually died and then told the story about they got to see the story about how what happened to Tufus there's supposed to be two of us and he was talking about like how because um, that's what the wizard always said was that there's always the two of us working together and they got to kind of see like this kind of sad story backstory about this creature and how it was like this construct or golem that was created that just didn't have a purpose anymore mm-hmm. and eventually found just by happenstance this way to this uh, to this um, you know prince that was traveling and he ended up capturing them and then took off with them and, you know, became this kind of amalgamation of these two beings. And uh, eventually they freed it and stuff, and that was kind of the end of the campaign with that. But I we had a little side campaign. But I always thought it would be cool to actually play that character, the two of, the Tufus character, mm-hmm. as different, you know, taking on different roles and, and taking, you know, seeing its personality come through in different creatures or a singular creature that it's kind of amalgamated with. Um, because I always found that, you know, I love tragic backstory, but I love having a character that, you know, kind of can seem on the fence about being good or evil, but you know that there's reasonings. I I find villains, like you said before, villains that are just evil for the sake of being evil are really boring. Mm -hmm. I like, you know, uh, I like characters that are villainous or, or malicious in some respect, but there's a reason why. There's some reason why they're doing it. Maybe it's not obvious to everyone else, and that's what the interesting part about him is. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was always a that was a cool character that I wish I would have seen something bigger come out of. But um, yeah, that's about it. I really haven't got to play. I mean, the new Orcus character I think is gonna be fun. Um, I've seen it in action from your viewpoint as an NPC, and uh, and 
uh, Josh Brolin in the in kind of a gangster type of thing. Like you, you know, I kind of see him. Have you seen a uh, Hail Caesar? Mm-hmm. Um, he has a, a kind of this um, facilitator type character for this, you know, um, Universal Studios type of place. And he's got this like pencil thin mustache, and he's kind of very looks very thirties kind of mafioso type, mm. um, you know, slicked um, dapper Dan hair and the whole thing. Kind of, I, I like that type of yeah. genre, and I like that type of character, and and I think it'll be fun to play and get to see. And I think it's interesting to know that the other players in the group that are also playing or have been playing Fallen um, know what I can bring to bear and waiting to see what I'll do with it. I think yeah. it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, too. definitely. Definitely. So, uh, what's your favorite game line? Game line, um, White, or Werewolf is always good um, because, like you said, the cosmology. I think I love reading like Vampire, like the Book of Nod. I liked reading um, about where it links into the Bible stuff. I think Demon's really cool as well. I think that, I mean, when you've got a book as old and as, you know, well-researched as a Bible and you start throwing in stuff like that, it's just amazing. Hmm. There's so many possibilities. Um, Werewolf, I think, is cool because the cosmology is totally created. And, yeah, they borrow things from here or there, but it's really its own thing. The triad's really kind of its own unique um, um, pantheon and mm. I think that's I love that I think it's really cool um, and it's it's it can be as complicated or as minimalistic as you want it to be and you can explore different avenues of it and there's just so much out there that if you want for ref- re- reference material made by World of Darkness by White Wolf you can find it for each of the different mm. uh, creatures the wild is the only one that kind of have a little like lacking of you know that that kind of we were made from the werewolves but it's just always kind of been like werewolves come from the wild there you go yeah but if you want to look into the weaver if you want to look into the worm the book of the worm is really cool for bad guys lots of cool you can have whole stories just based around each individual creature in that book oh yeah um and i and i do like yeah i mean you can seem a little captain planet that we're fighting you know for the earth but i mean it worked for avatar it, it is a solid thing. It's something that we all deal with, and I think it's a, especially now more days than maybe back in the '90s. Even I mean, we all were aware of like that stuff, but it's really come to a head lately. And whether you believe in global warming or not, there's there's lots of scientific evidence proving to it. You know, there's lots of different things you can do, and you could take Garbage Island and make an entire yeah game based around I mean, Garbage Island. For me, the great thing about that stuff in in Werewolf is that no matter what your political ideology is, you can always say to a player who says something like, I don't believe in global warming or I don't believe in climate change. And you can, you know, you can put your foot down and you can say, do you believe that 7 billion humans and growing has affected the world that we live in? Yeah. And if you say yes, then it doesn't matter if, you know, climate change is real or not. We're still affecting it. Oh, yeah. We're still creating negative, you know, consequences that yeah. we've yet to understand. And if you say, you know, no, I don't believe, or you say, you know, yes, I do believe it. Cool. Yeah. Then... We have no issue, right. you know. We're still good to go. Yeah. So, and I mean, you can, and you can, and you can. Yeah, that's true. And you can viably a character that wants to really. I mean, if you have a player, and this is, I mean, without going into problem players, and if you really have a player that that wants to fight tooth and nail, that I don't. The what I don't like about Werewolf is the fact that they're all tree hugging hippies. There's characters. There's clans. There's ideologies within the the different tribes within the various camps within those tribes yeah. that you could find something that they are interested in that no, don't, don't I mean, just because you're playing a werewolf doesn't mean you have to play a character. That's an environmental eco terrorist. Yeah. There's, there's everything from a lawyer to, to an environmental eco terrorist to a taxi driver. And there's, and, you, and there's so many different philosophies and politics within that that you can worry about mm-hmm. focusing your character on. Yeah. So I, I, I do like that. I think it's a really solid system. Out of all of their systems, one of the most solid systems they have. Um, changing Breeds is always cool. Um, 
I would probably also say if it wasn't changeling breed or the changing breeds, um, I would like my hand at a wraith game, mm -hmm. though I never got to try one. I, I I played a wraith in a in the um, Mind's Eye Theater, the LARP, mm -hmm. once, and it was a lot of fun because. Uh, Jonesy was running it with me um, back in the 90s, late 90s. And uh, it was a lot of fun because he did a really... I told him that I wanted to have an NPC that was a that was a um, kind of a, a specter, um, spirit of the dead type of character, like a harvester of souls type of character. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we made it and I got to play a couple games of it. And... It was a lot of fun playing the whole like harrowing and and like you know if my if my um um the shadow took over like and I and I lost control what could I do there and he would make up these kind of like whole like um, he had these kind of whole things set up with like a little mini adventures for me to go on that was kind of aside from the rest of the group it was a lot of fun to play not you know I obviously t I, I prefer tabletop over live action but. Um, it, it's again like you said it's it's such a depressing game hmm. um, every time I've had people run run it they don't last very long yeah um, but, but I think it'd be fun to play one once you know just to try it out yeah um, I wouldn't want to play I think that the uh, Risen are really cool I, I just wouldn't want to play one I'd want to play like you know bare bones Wraith yeah Risen are so laser focused that... yeah you know when especially like when you when you have a player who's already a laser focused player like you yeah, yeah and then you give him a character that is designed to be laser focused yeah. and then you say go be laser focused and yeah. then next thing you know he's ripped through your storyline in what you planned on it being you know a, a two month ride right he's ripped through it in three weeks and you're like shit like you know. well I mean like if the last um, did you see the last American Gods mm -hmm. okay um, for those of you that haven't I'm not trying to give too much away but um, everyone's already, at this point already knows that Laura Moon is coming back mm -hmm. you get to see her undead strength and action yeah when you've got a character that can rip people apart barehanded yeah and, and that's pretty accurate the way yeah. it is when or you play a, kick a guy in the balls and make his whole <laughs> skeleton fly out from, <laughs> through his head. Ridiculous. Yeah. Then you're like, what, you know, I mean, when you've got that. And, and if you think about it, I mean, The Crow was as great as a show as it was, the original one. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of filler that had nothing to do with The Crow. Sure. Because of the fact that his whole purpose was to come back and wreak vengeance on all those motherfuckers that yeah. killed him and his old lady yeah and the fact that you know that's the way they base that whole you know series of wraith off of was to be like you, you know if you're willing to come back from the dead yeah. especially in the wraith underworld you know finding stygian empire finding random specters and shades that are all tw going to twist your poor corpus up or just eat you yeah that they can even do that the fact that you're going you know, to find your own demon uh, literally a demon that hangs out with you that's your own like worst fears and, and and wrath and everything combined into like a living form that hangs out with you if you can get all of that and then come and crawl your ass out of the grave you're going to do it for a singular purpose. And so it's, I can see, you know, when you were telling me about, you know, Jim playing, it was like, man, that's got to be rough to throw them into a game and not have them want to constantly be, because everything about them is based around that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, you, you build a character knowing damn well that you're building a character that's not designed to run with a group of other people. And then you say, yeah, you know what? I'll have you run with some other people. Yeah. And then afterwards, you're blown away because the character has nothing to do with anyone else. And yeah. then you're like, well, that kind of sucked. But it's not the player's fault. No. And it's not the other player's fault. It's not. It's, it, it's my fault because I should have known better. And, yeah. well. you know, and you can't create a group of Risen... At least not no. realistically. Yeah, realistically. Because be, then they, yeah. you know, you'd say, "Well, we're all going to run off on this one mission." 
no, they're all going to run off on their own missions. Yeah. You know, so you just kind of go, eh. you know, as yeah. great as they are, as cool as the Risen are, you just kind of have to realize that that they're just not that viable. I in think a Mummy would be a cool alternative to that. Yeah, Mummy, Mummy is cool. Mummy has a lot of Mummy has a lot of oomph behind it. Um, when you start digging into their powers like alchemy and effigy and the new nomenclature yeah. thing. I like, I always call it Ren magic just because, yeah. you know, um, yeah. I am the second edition mummy guy, not the yeah. third edition. Yeah. <clears throat> but, um, and did they come up with like a golem version that I read something about like um, Prometheans? Um, in the new world of darkness, there new is, world of darkness. yes, there Prometheans. is, there is Prometheans. They are Frankenstein, yeah, golem right. style yeah. uh, uh, things that are kind of reanimated. I think that would and be then, cool. then there is also Immortals in New World of Darkness, and they have. We, 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 now we did that with the unofficial Highlander. That came yes, out but no, but this edition. this isn't this isn't the the Highlander thing. Um, that was hilarious. Yeah, that was just. Well, so you have a just stupid. just so just so you know. If you have a Highlander that can only be killed yeah. by cutting its head off through the quick and then have the quickening, your asshole players yes. are going to everyone <laughs> is going to try and cut your head off. And, and if they don't, they're going to use you as meat shield. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're going to use you as a bullet. Yeah, sponge. that was so funny. And it's really cool, but it's not cool. Yeah, it was so funny. To, to, what was it, John? Uh, it was it was Nate. Oh, it was it, Nate. Yeah, yeah it was Nate. Brent. Yeah, Brent picked him up. Picked and, him up and used him as a meat shield, yeah. running into a room full of guys with with, with machine guns. guns. Yeah. yeah, and they just they just riddled the poor yeah. guy. Yeah, you know. And then that he's like, boy, all right, yeah. here you go. You're Brent's gonna like, live. You're yeah, fine." Yeah, Brent's like, "Don't worry about it." You <laughs> cut his head off. He's yeah. fine. Yeah, but like, um, um, no immortals. Um, there are a lot of different kinds, but like um, the one that I, I'm, I'm immediately recalling are like Elizabeth Bathory, where they have to bathe in blood. Oh, cool. Yeah, they have yeah. to bathe in blood, and then uh, they sort of, uh, in a kind of ritualistic way, where it's not necessarily um, the um, the implements and the accoutrements aren't really that important. But it is to you, yeah. like the ritual in your head is what makes it work. Sure. And so, like, you have to go around and get, you know, blood from virgin girls or virgin boys or whatever it may be. But it has to be very specific things. And yeah. then you have to step into a shower yeah. and shower in their blood. Or you have to step huh. into a bathtub and soak in their blood for 10 minutes or whatever it may be. Every single one of them has different rituals, and and there's a few different kinds of immortals, as I recall. But that's just the one that I'm I can that's, I can that remember. That sounds interesting. But uh, I think that with the uh, and not to go off on a tangent, but I think with the new um, the new uh, what are they calling it the the dark the dark movies the the new rebirth of the monster mm -hmm. movies that yeah you know, the Universal Universal's yeah. doing with the Mummy remake. Mm -hmm. Is gonna you're gonna see a lot of people start taking interest in horror. Oh yeah. Again, especially like that classic, you know, and 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 uh, seeing already seeing you know Jekyll and Hyde and, and seeing that come about is looks really cool. I yeah. think it's gonna be, um, I think it's gonna be a lot of the rebirth of horror. And, and yeah, the idea of Russell Crowe being uh, Doctor Jekyll yeah. is interesting to me yeah. at least. Yeah. Um, it's kind of angry anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Like, so be it. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, are you just Mister Hyde all the yeah, time? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be a resurgence of it, and I think, yeah. you know, I think that once that starts to, you know, kind of trickle back into the consciousness. Not, not that I have an issue with slashers, you know, because slashers always come around every five, ten years. You know, saw uh, the saw movies come out and. Then suddenly you have this breakout push of slashers. Yeah. Now they seem to be really focused heavily on the the sort of resurrection of the exorcist style uh, mm. films with these possessions and um, all this other stuff. There's a new one out about uh, a girl who finds a box that lets her make wishes. Mm. And at the end of Seven Wishes, the box goes crazy or some nonsense. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're getting a kind of resurgence in the styles, the genres, uh, the or I should say the subgenres. 
But I think that once the universals start to break out, because I have a hard time believing that a Tom Cruise movie can fail anymore. Yeah, I mean, um, he's so high budget. Yeah, and I feel like you know the success not necessarily domestic but i feel like the success overseas will be extraordinary yeah and you know i think that they'll more than recoup their their money and i hope that they start a a new dynasty of the universal monsters and you know i loved benicio del toro as the wolf man oh god i love that movie he was so great um i even liked the um was it Dracula Untold or yeah. Retold or whatever yeah. it was? Yeah. I thought that guy was great. Yeah, that was a pretty um, good one. You know, uh, I felt like, I mean, they obviously took a lot of liberties, but right. who cares? Yeah. You know, we're, we're at a point now where if you have a guy that dresses up like Bela Lugosi, people are just going to laugh. Yeah. And, you know, you have to crank it up to 11 now sure. every time you step up to the plate. Yeah. And, you know, and I feel like Benicio Del Toro's... Wolfman did it and it did it in spades you know what I loved was that you know one of the first films about uh, a werewolf was about a guy who is in like the Andes or Tibet or something Mm -hmm. and he goes into a cave and he finds a little boy and he gets bitten by the little boy and it turns out the little boy is a werewolf Mm mm-hmm and then he becomes a werewolf and then he has to get killed because that's the fate of all werewolves. Right. Well, what I loved about that Benicio del Toro film yeah. was that they made the father yeah. that guy. That's how it all started. And I was like, "Oh my god, that's incredible because yeah. uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a huge werewolf, yeah. you know, uh, aficionado and I, and I've seen like even that god awful like 1920s uh uh La Belle, La Bette, you know, French werewolf yeah. movie that's supposed to be Beauty and the Beast, but it's based on werewolf right. uh, uh, mythology and and all that stuff. And, you know, so for me, the idea that they would resurrect the, uh, you know, the, the Universal films. I think it's going to be a blast. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a lot you know, of and, fun. And every time a movie like that comes out, or, or a TV show like... American Gods Mm -hmm. it inspires an entire new wave of people who want to play White Wolf oh you know Uh, it yeah can't wait oh my god it's gonna be so brutal I can't it's gonna be so brutal I can't wait yeah there's gonna be a surge of people who say man I want to play a clown yeah I want to play an evil clown or I want to play the people that stop evil what was funny was that uh, just a couple days ago um, a a couple friends of mine were were talking to me about um, my first book uh, Ouroboros yeah and they were like and they said yeah you know um, I, I like the book but you know I really thought it was crass of you to follow in the footsteps of all of those psychos last year who dressed up like clowns to try and scare people and I just laughed and I said I published that book in February that stuff didn't start happening until June yeah so they must have read my book and then all said we need to dress we up did. like crazy and clowns to scare people. What you didn't what they what, what the general public didn't realize is that those were all Ouroboros fans yeah. trying to push yeah. the Autumnville Ouroboros yeah. book yeah. available on Amazon and Kindle yeah. and barnesandnoble.com yeah. possibly. Uh, and that's and that's that's what they didn't realize is that they weren't trying to scare people, they're trying to sell your book yeah. for you. Which they did a God, shitty it's job. Fit. They did a shit job, <laughs> but yeah. So uh, I think uh, I think I think we've uh, bored you folks long enough. No, I, we're gonna yeah. call it. We're gonna call it quits for the night for sure. Um, and uh, we will be back with more Crypto Lab as soon as we can. Absolutely. So uh, you guys have a great day. Have a great night. Whatever it is, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye.